Hey guys, Shane here, so welcome to this diorama tutorial, and in this video I'm going to take you through how I recreated this Bastogne themed diorama base. So the centerpiece of our diorama is going to be this resin farmhouse by Diodump. So I got this in resin, so you can bulk it, there are buildings in either resin or plaster depending what suits you. So I just went for the resin option, and I just give these a quick scrub in warm soapy water to remove any release agent, and just assemble the various pieces with gel type super glue. So there's a few gaps in each filling so I'm just going to take some Vallejo plastic putty so this is some water based putty and I'm just going to apply it straight out of the tube and I'm just going to take um, I'm just going to dip my finger into water basically and wipe away the excess and I get a nice flush seam this way. So firstly I just given the building a quick priming layer of Mr. Surfacer black so this is going to be my shadow layer as well as a primer layer. And then I'm going to take some Tamiya XF60 or sorry, XF59 Desert Yellow, should I say. And this is going to kind of give me a nice sandstone style finish. And I've just thinned this down with some lacquer thinner about 50-50. And I'm spraying it out of a harder and Steenbeck Evolution with a 0.4 needle at about 25 psi. Now you can kind of see that I'm mottling this on because I, I don't want to lose the entire um, black uh, base coat. I kind of want to see some of this showing through and it's just going to give me um, an idea of shadow. So I'm not really a diorama builder as such so I was very much inspired by the fantastic work of CW Modeling who does absolutely amazing scratch built diorama bases and his buildings are absolutely gorgeous so I really did um, just take a lot of inspiration and, and uh, fights from his videos. So do check out his uh, channel, link in the description. So that's going to take some Tamiya Deck Tan and I'm just going to start uh, painting in or should I say sketching in these capstones here. Again I'm not being too clean, I don't mind getting a little bit of overspray. And then I'm going to take our desert yellow and just add a little bit of white X2 and again just tinning it down about 50-50 with some lacquer thinner and then I'm going to start mottling this on and this is just going to break up the monotony of the desert yellow. Just gives us a little bit of fading and a little bit of visual interest. So once everything's allowed to dry we're just going to start masking off some of the areas that I, I want to protect because we're going to add some plaster work here to the side of the building. Some of the more um, finicky areas, I'm just going to use some Humbro Maskol or Latex uh, Masking Flute. And this is just going to be uh, flowed into these areas here where I want to protect some of the brickwork that just would be a little bit too awkward to try to tape. So to create the uh, plaster render on the side of the building, I'm just going to take some X2 white from Tamiya. I'm just going to model this on. I want to keep some of the, the uh, black undercoat showing through in certain areas. I'm just kind of slowly building this color up and modeling it on. So now I'm going to start basing in the roof tiles and for this we're just going to take a little bit of XF63 German Grey. You could also use NATO Black or Tire Black for this. And I'm just going to start just spraying this in. Again I've masked off some of the areas so I don't get any overspray onto the brickwork. Just a, a quick little shield here as you can see with a little bit of Tamiya tape. And I'm just going to slowly build this up, just a few layers, you know, I try not to do everything in one go. 
and then just taking a little bit of white mixed into our German grey at different um, ratios. So you, can, so you can just add a drop or two or even push it further and further. I'm just going to start mottling on this lighter colour, just focusing on several different tiles as I go. I actually found this quite therapeutic, it just uh, you can kind of switch off and uh, just start painting the patterns. But the trick is less is more, so try to resist the urge to overdo the highlight by painting in most of these tiles. We want to keep as much of the German grey possible uh, visible as well. So just small amounts at a time, um, hold the model away from you just to see how it looks. Um, you know, hold it under the light at different angles and just to see how it looks to your eye and then go that way and just keep adding until you're happy but try not to do it too much in one go because you can lose control of what you're doing that way. So now everything is dried and all the masks have been removed I'm just going to take some flail model colour middle brown. So I'm looking for any kind of dark um, brown colours and I'm just going to start picking out uh, some of the individual stones here in the masonry. So I'm going to take a little bit of Vallejo Grey Green, so just a slightly lighter and slightly warmer colour, and I'm just going to pick out a few more bricks with this as well. It's really up to you what colours you want, so the best thing to do is just uh, Google search some old buildings from the area you're trying to model, whether it be in this case Bastogne or somewhere like Falaise or Kong or whatever, and just get an idea of what the, the kind of brick colours look like. So once I have the, the bricks uh, painted in, you can kind of see that it looks a bit stark at the moment. However, we're going to blend things together now by giving things pretty heavy dry brush with some flat white by uh, Flaho model color. So I'm just taking a pretty soft bristle brush here and I'm going to apply it relatively heavily. But the trick with dry brushing is to use something like a piece of tile or a piece of card rather than using um, tissue paper to remove the paint because we don't want to take the moisture out of the brush. If we use something like a piece of paper towel to remove the paint from your brush, what happens is you pull the moisture out of the brush and create a very chalky consistency, which we really do not want. And by doing this, it just pulls everything together and weathers everything as well. So I painted in the doors just some light blue, so any kind of colour you want is up to yourself. I went for like a sky blue. And I'm just taking a little bit of Vallejo deck tan and I'm just dry brushing that colour in just to kind of create a little bit of a wooden, um, a worn wooden effect. So once the dry brushing is allowed to dry, I'm just going to take some Tamiya XF67 uh, NATO green and I'm going to heavily, heavily tin this down. So this is tinned about maybe 60% thinner to paint, very, very heavily diluted. And I've turned my PSI down to about 15 PSI, and I'm going to take this very, very dilute green color 
And this is how I'm gonna kind of bring in an ele element of damp and mold into the masonry. And I'm gonna focus around corners and around the base of our uh, building here. As you can see, it's very light and transparent. We don't want this too stark, and we can always build it up in a few layers if we need it to be a bit stronger. And, and this is, a, I had a lot of fun doing this little step. It just really does add th that this building, that this is a quite an old building. Um, perhaps there's been generations of the same farming family living in it. And very much like anyone uh, from farming backgrounds or knows anything about like agriculture like that, that's very much the way things were. Even here in Ireland, you know, you'd have generations of the same family right up until really the, the 60s and 70s that lived more or less in the same place, like be passed down. So these, these buildings throughout Europe saw a massive amount of use and were quite lived in. So it's kind of nice to bring that kind of sense of time and longevity into a, an old structure like this. And also just makes it look a little bit more visually interesting. I'm also bringing the green here just to add some moss, doing um, vertical lines down the side of the roof here. So moving on to the diorama base itself. So we're just taking a cheap picture frame basically bought from a pound shop or a discount store. And I just took a 30 millimeter insulation foam that I just cut the shape and I just clad it using a little bit of hot glue with some balsa wood, and that's the frame for our base. So I'm just gonna test fit everything here just to get an idea of how everything's gonna to fit together. I still don't really know about the, the final composition, how I want this diorama to look. So I'm just gonna do a lot of test fitting as we go. So once I'm happy, I'm just going to remove some of the excess balsa wood and keeping about maybe 10, 15 millimeter of, of material um, over the actual thing. And there's something so satisfying about cutting balsa wood, I don't know what it is. So now just to seal our insulation foam so it doesn't react to anything, I'm just going to take some Gorilla wood glue here. Any type of PVA or Elmer's, Elmer's glue, should I say, or wood glue will do. And I'm just going to spread this along. You can use your, your finger for this if you wish. I just don't want to create a complete mess, which I'm going to abandon very soon. And this is just going to protect the foam so nothing solvent is going to touch it and melt the foam, which is always a risk working with this type of material. So I've applied a pretty heavy layer, and while it's still wet, I'm actually going to mount our building directly into this uh, wood glue. And this is just going to lock everything into place. And it's going to build up um, the edges here just to ensure that I get a nice strong bond. So for adding the actual ground form, I'm going back to the tried and tested veteran uh, of all dioramas, which is das clay, which is a uh, air dry clay. So I'm doing this a few days later, so the actual uh, wood glue is fully dried now. And this is just a little trick I learned over the years, just to apply another layer of either PVA or wood glue or whatever type of water-based glue you're using. And what this is going to do is, this is going to help prevent the uh, the air dry clay from cracking too much. It just keeps everything together and stops it from contracting too much, as well as just ensuring that the clay won't lift off the base. Now this is messy, so you can see that I'm actually wearing gloves, which I'm going to throw away after a while because I'm going to get fed up. And I just start applying small sections of das clay here and just working with my fingers, just try to create a somewhat smooth finish. I don't need it perfectly smooth, after all we're replicating nature. So you know, a few little undulations here and there isn't bad, uh, if anything is something we want. And as you can see here, after about 24 hours, the clay is fully dry and the wood glue did its job. It stopped everything from cracking. So 
So now I'm just going to just clad the um, base here just with a little bit of Flejo flat black. This is a nice semi-gloss satin black color that matches the kind of glossy finish of the actual picture frame. And once that's all allowed to dry, I'm just going to take some painter's tape here. So this is just um, DIY or decorator's masking tape, nothing fancy. I'll just remove some of the tackiness with my fingers and then I'm just going to apply this to protect the uh, edges of the diorama base. So now we're going to start adding texture and actual ground effect to our, our diorama base. And for this, we're going to AK's Interactive Wet Ground. So this is a, an acrylic paste that's very textured. And uh, I'm just going to use it directly out of the pot, just using a, an old brush here. And I'm just going to start building this up. I'm going to actually apply um, several thick coats, but I'm going to work in sections. So I'll just do one section first, and I work my way across the base. In that case, then I don't have to worry about it drying on me. As you can see here, I just apply it somewhat thickly. This stuff doesn't really shrink once you apply it, so you don't have to worry about it cracking or, or shrinking if you go on too thick. The only thing I'm going to really do to add texture it's just add a bit of static grass that I'd lying away, uh, lying around. So this static grass, I think, is just um, I say it's probably six mil static grass. I think this is old Jarvis stuff. I think uh, it doesn't really matter what it is or even the color of it. And I'm just going to sprinkle this onto the still wet ground effect, and then I want to stipple it in. And that's just going to create a really muddy kind of feel because I want this to be on the edge of Bath Stone, you know, on, on the edge of the small little villages around the perimeter. So this is already just agricultural land. So I want to give the impression that these are just churned up fields and a small little dirt laneway. So by just doing this, this helps sell that effect and just give a little bit of both texture and give an idea of where this is set. And I can keep adding extra layers of that paste on top of the flock if I so wish, like I'm doing here. So I'll just add a few small little scoops of that paste on top of the flock and then mix it all together until I'm happy. So you can see me here, I'm just going to fly through this now, just using the same technique. I work in sections, applying the paste somewhat thickly, just making sure everything's blended and stippled in, just to make sure that there's no real brush or tide marks. And then while everything is still wet, I'm going to start applying flock to the edges. So I'm not going to put any flock in the middle because that's going to be our road, which I'm going to show you how to replicate in a moment. So just around the edges that I want to kind of maybe give the idea this is a field or there's um, agricultural land just out of the base if you like or out of shot if you like. So I've left the ground paste to dry for about half an hour, so 30 minutes. And then just taking the back of my brush, I'm just going to gently start pulling it along the road section here, which is just the center of our, of our base. And that's going to create some nice tire marks. I did try using like spare wheels from my bits box, but I found using the wheels, it actually just pulled the ground texture up. So just using the back of an appropriate size brush, you can create some very simple um, tire marks and tread marks. And then any area where maybe I pulled a bit too much of the ground texture up and the dust clay is exposed, I'm just going to take a, uh, a nice small brush here that I don't mind sacrificing to the paint gods. And I'm just going to paint back in 
our ground texture to ensure that there's no bare clay showing through. So now that everything's allowed to dry, we're going to get onto the, the exciting stuff, which is the snow effects. And something I actually have very little experience with, so I was really excited to try this. And I'm going to be using a lot of AK products for this. So first we're going to start adding some volume, because around the Siege of Bastogne, it snowed quite heavily, especially around the 20th um, of uh, December. So we're going to take some of their snow sprinkles, which is basically a clear acrylic paste. It's like just like a volume. So this is just going to create um, a little bit depth and thickness that we can apply our snow on top of. And then once I'm happy with um, a layer here, I'm just going to take some snow micro balloons. I'm, going, I'm wearing gloves for this because we don't want to get this stuff on our skin and also you may want to wear a mask you don't want to inhale this stuff even though it says it's um, not crushed glass but still don't, you still don't want it in your lungs and then just taking a brush here I'm just going to start um, dumping it onto the still wet snow sprinkles and this is just going to act as our binder and just like I did with the ground effects I'm just working in small sections at a time and moving slowly across the board. I'm not doing it all in one go. And then I'm just going to start sprinkling on some of our micro balloons on top of the still wet uh, base layer. And this is going to give us a nice kind of fluffy snow effect. One thing to bear in mind though is if you're using any flock that is not sealed, I would recommend sealing any kind of flock that you're using with maybe a gloss or satin varnish before you apply your snow. Otherwise the dye in the flock can react with some of these snow effects. So I would recommend if you're in doubt, just hit the model base with maybe some satin varnish, let it cure fully, and then do this step, just so you don't get any weird reactions. So now I'm going to start painting in the terror fair or the, the road sections. And I'm just painting in our, our, um, our base layer here, so our snow sprinkles. And I'm just leaving it out of the areas where we put in the tread marks. Now there will be fakels mounted to this, but I want to ensure that I actually weather the base first. This is just how I'm doing it. You, you could basically mount the fakels in place and then try to put the snow around it, but just it, the, the fakels would get in the way. So by doing it this way, I can focus on adding the snow to the base. So I'm just going to add some footprints to the still wet uh, snow effects by just uh, taking my brush and, and just tapping it into, my, into the, uh, the snow drifts. And this is how you create some basic footprints. And then once that's dry, that will set solid. And that kind of clear gel underneath, which is the uh, sprinkles, will create a sense of ice. It's, really, it's actually quite a cool little effect once it's uh, fully dried. And now I'm going to start doing the same on the roof. So on the roof, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to pretend the wind is blowing a certain direction. So I can visualize maybe where like the snow will catch and build up. And I'm just basically tapping the micro balloons into the into the base layer here, into the uh, the snow sprinkles, and just letting it naturally build up, just like it would in nature. I 
exactly the same with the, with the roof. I don't want to cover the entire roof with snow. I do want patches of the tiles um, showing through. So I'm just going to kind of, again, just pretend, you know, um, how the wind might blow and how it might build up snow onto the roof and maybe parts of it might fall away. Just little narratives that you can tell yourself just to help you visualize what you're doing. Now, so I'm taking some ice sprinkles. So this is a free cool product. However, do wear gloves wearing this. This stuff, I do think it's crushed glass. So we do not want this near your eyes or your lungs. And I'm also just gonna take some wet effects, which is like um, an enamel gloss. And this is gonna be our binding agent. So I'm just going to apply a thick coat of wet effects onto the, the window ledge here. And I'm just going to add some of our ice sprinkles here and this is going to give us a sense of frost and compacted ice and snow and after a few layers you do get a really nice kind of kind of icy and frosty effect which is really cool and i'm going to do the same here now on the areas we didn't paint in snow so again it's applying our our wet effects as a base layer you could do you could use gloss varnish for this if you wished as well like no you don't have to use exactly what i'm using here so something that's a bit glossy that can convey like a wet a muddy um, surface and then I'm going to put the ice sprinkles on top of it. And this is going to give the ground just a lovely kind of fro compacted ice and frost finish, which is, for me, something that's always kind of missing in, in a lot of ice bases and frozen bases or snow bases. Um, it's just, you know, you'll have, the, you'll have the snow, but normally ice and frost comes before the snow, if you like. So it just, just kind of brings everything together and just makes that base look extra cold and extra miserable, which we love. And once I've tapped off the excess and the wet effects are allowed to dry, we get this lovely frosty effect. Um, I was really impressed by how that came out. I didn't, I didn't really know what I was going to do, but I didn't realize it would actually kind of fluff up and actually like look like ice crystals. Um, this is, I, I was very impressed by this. It's a very kind of cool way of creating frost and ice. So for the Fagels, so I'm going to be depicting 10th Armour Division in Bastogne, which are, I think it was Combat Command B of 10th Armour that are actually in the encirclement with the 101st. They're totally overlooked in this battle, even though even McAuliffe himself says without them they never would have held Bastogne. And uh, so for this, I'm doing like the rear area, so I'm taking some of their support Fagels. So in this case, I'm just using um, an old Tamiya Jeep I had in my stash that I've weathered up um, accordingly. And just added maybe some scratch built uh, canvas covers for the windshield, just out of some Tamiya tape. And I'm also going to be using our Deuce and a Half, our GMC here, which has a full video on how I built, weathered, um, or painted and weathered it. So I'll have a link in the description if you want to see how I do my winter weathering. And basically, what I'm going to do is I'm going to allow the base to dry, go back to our wet ground effects, and paint in where the wheels will sit of each vehicle, and then just blend in um the snow effects into that just like how we did on the base so we do have to kind of go back and touch up things but once everything is in place and dried the fake should sit quite realistically into the base um i could have put actual locating pins into the the base for the for the vehicles but i just didn't know what i was going to add at the time i've also added two figures one from alpine models and one from tamia and i've just used a paper clip to pin them in place and then just did a little bit of 
um, mud and snow effects on their boots just to blend them into the base. So guys, I really hope you enjoyed this. This was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed working on this over the last few months. And uh, it's one of the few dioramas I, I do. I don't tend to do many just because I don't have the space for them. However, there will be three more dioramas based on Bastogne coming after this. That uh, one I'm currently working on now, which is called the King of Bastogne, which is going to be Cobra King and the Fort Armour Division. And we're going to be doing one, obviously, with the 101st. So keep an eye out for the other Bastogne dioramas coming up in the near future. So guys, thank you so much for watching. I really hope this has given you some ideas on what you can do for your own bases. If you have any questions at all, please just drop them down in the comments and I'll get back to you. I've been Shane. Thank you so much, guys. Happy modeling, and I'll catch you in the next video. Bye-bye.